Like, I think we grew up in Chinatown, um, almost, you know, to get, uh, uh, at the same era. Well, I came when I was nine years old. And then you kind of, like, wanted to stay down there and continue working in the community. Well, the thing is that I... I made a commitment to my community. I mean, I grew up here, and I think there's still a lot that needs to be done. Well, you know, I kind of started out when the um, Vietnam War, um, the anti-Vietnam War demonstrations, I started to go to that, and I graduated from college, and I needed a job. And I was working for the city under Mayor Lindsay, and it was like, a Probably a good starting job for an artist, but you know, two years you get bored, and then you get involved with the city politics, and it's like, wait a moment, something's wrong here. And then I started to, um, and then I started like working with some of the groups in Chinatown, and I thought I liked that better. So I wound up getting a sort of a community job and um, working in a grassroots artist organization. So. There is a lot of, I guess, heavy discussion of what direction an artist should go, or, or an art community, arts organization should go, in what direction, and um, do, do the civil rights movement with the blacks and Hispanics, uh, the, the more vocalization of, of community work and the government, federal government was channeling more funding for community arts organizations so that there wouldn't be any more riots in the streets, I think, was the main purpose of uh, having uh, funding for, for such a group. And, um, That's how I got involved in working in using an arts organization as a, as a foundation for some community access programs. I think you would call that what it's called. <laughs> Back when? I don't know. Well, but I mean, you know, in terms of getting the facilities, the materials, the flyers, such an organization has to start off with those uh, fundamental. Uh, beginnings. And well, one of the problems, I think, is because of um, 
there's still this sort of uh, fear of being caught, for being illegal, for a lot of um, barriers that are placed in front of entering a new country and culturally and language-wise and so on. And, um, and of course, the bottom line is the uh, funding sources. And it's also uh, where, um, I guess, one, one group of people can openly express themselves with one political thought. <laughs> For myself, it was the first time I took a course um, to learn about the whole history of Chinese in America. The first time I found out about the history of, of my people in this country. And part of it was like I was so mad and upset about what they had to go through, the discrimination and the oppression, you know, the, the Chinese Exclusion Act and, and all the struggle that my ancestor had to go through. And on the other hand, and somehow I felt that I found my roots. It was kind of interesting even to find out that um, I did have a great grandfather who worked on the railroad. I know. I know. Once you start tracing your history, because my son Kevin was doing it. Oh, did he interview? interview? My son uh, Kevin was yeah, doing Yeah, interview. interview you. And he interviewed and my grandfather. He we did. asked him to interview uh -huh. him. And it was interesting. He, just, he wrote down questions. I didn't even know that my grandfather served under General Patton in World War II. Wow. He was a cook yes. at that time. My, my grandfather. Grandfather. Yeah. My grandfather came when he was actually a teenager. And then he went back to get married in China. Uh -huh. And then after that, he left my grandmother and my mother there. Uh -huh. My mother didn't see her father again until she was in her 30s. In the 60s. Yeah. I mean, when she was like 30-something years old when we immigrated yeah. from Hong Kong. That was the first time that we saw her father again. Yeah. My father wanted to come so bad. It was like he tried so many different ways to come to the United States. I mean, we filed for immigration paper, but our paper somehow got lost or whatever, so it took a very long time. And he went out to, to Hong Kong when my brother was born. And we've been there for a long time. He was waiting and waiting. He got us all baptized and thought that maybe the missionary would help. And then he went to South America and came to the United States, and then he was going to stay here illegally until our paper finally showed up. He finally decided to go back, because if he didn't come back, we wouldn't have been able to come. So he went back and brought the whole family here. And when we first got here, we had no place to stay. They, uh, Basically, the associations would arrange things like that, wasn't it? Well, not really, because my aunt was here, and relatives were here. They helped out, you know, he borrowed money so that he can fly back to Hong Kong to, to get us. And so we stayed in New York. Uh -huh. And luckily my grandparents at that time, they were in Philadelphia, so they moved out because they, my grandfather hadn't seen my mother ever since she was born. Uh -huh. So at least we had a place to stay for a few months uh -huh. until we found an apartment. But it was it was rough. My father worked in the restaurant. He worked all the way up in the Bronx. You know. Wow. Came really? back every day in the subway and and he, um, you know, he had flat feet, so he had, his feet was aching him every day. I mean, he used to walk up the stairs without his shoes, have to take his shoes off. My mother worked in the garment factory, and I worked there, you know, I helped her out once in a while. And during the summer, and I really didn't like it, but, um, and a lot of time you hear how unfair it was. And for myself, I say, well, something's got to change. So what are we doing here? <laughs> That's the same. We came to New York when we were 10 years old. But um, never understood how, ever, you know, in the little, in the, out in Portland, Oregon, and being the only Asian family for about, in the neighborhood of different mixed ethnics, you might say. And, um, but it was kind of surprising how my parents were matched, <laughs> like from my, Mother's father's side. Mm. Well, in those days, they were all matched. You know? In a way, yeah, yeah. But my father did it so that my grandfather did it so arranged. Like he was in, working him by himself in the laundry, and he had the sort of privilege to go to China about nine times. Mm. So each time he sired a child, <laughs> and then eventually, um, you know, 
he tried to find ways to uh, bring each child to the States or something like that. So he arranged the paper for my father, so as being an American citizen, through some association that they had paper names. Somehow they arranged that. And, um, and so by marrying my mother, he can bring his daughter to the States. And that was how we got born in the middle of this <laughs> area. And then from there, my mother wanted to come to New York City to, to, as a family reunion, I think, for my grandfather. Because by 1960, he, my grandfather was able to arrange all his children and his wife to come to America. I mean, I mean I'm happily married um, for 16 years. <laughs> Um, my husband is very supportive, and the reason is that we came out of the same struggle um, for fighting for the community, fighting for democratic rights, so that he's very supportive of the work that I'm doing in the community, and in that sense, he takes up a lot more work at home, you know, with the kids and things like that. And also, when I work in the community, I think a lot of times that we have the same common goal in terms of electoral politics and, and also in, in terms of community, I do see a lot of women getting involved. A lot of them are more involved in terms of charity work and social service type of thing. I mean, they have, they do, they have these women organizations who do, you know, charity work and they, they raise money, they contribute to different causes or they do health care. So they're out there doing the service kind of work but not so much in terms of in the field of education. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of barriers, but I think we begin to overcome a lot of them. And it's really important to continue that education process yeah. that people have to get involved. Mm. I mean, in terms of electoral politics, that we have a right and a responsibility to vote. And because it's a democracy, that we have to exercise that right that we do have to get involved and do have to have representation. Um, so from demonstrating, it just led naturally into that process because I thought it's not enough to just demonstrate on the outside. We also have to have leaders and, and someone who can speak for us on the inside. We didn't get the right to vote until way after World War II. Oh, and by, by after 1960. 1962, yeah. I think, when the War Brides Act or whatever. Um, what do you mean, Asians ourselves? Yeah. And, uh, and at that point, there wasn't a lot of Asians. I mean, it wasn't until 65 where there was a great you know, influx of immigration. And um, so we have to build on that. I, I, I think, yeah. The education of even the newcomers of the democratic process that's exercise to yourself. Yeah. Overwhelmed. Then you would have people, you know, the workers have rights, you know, you tell them about minimum wage or, you know, safe working conditions. Those are their rights. And they have to understand it. And even with a lot of the tenants that we work with, they have to understand that they have rights as tenants. You pay rent, okay. you have the right to heat and hot water. And you don't have it, you have a right to protest and try to fight for it. Um, but a lot of times, it's once people understand that, then they take the next step. social changes that had to happen in terms of uh, the factories, the restaurant, the laundry business. Most of these were sort of privately self-promoted type of business. Well, at that point, I mean, for a lot of the new immigrants, there was no other job opportunity. I mean, those, that's what, what's there. I mean, my...
Changing, isn't it? I think it's sort of like the storefronts on uh, Mott Street. A lot of them, have, have, the restaurants have closed, and I think um, yeah, but new ones open up because there's always oh, somebody I'm there ready to sure there's gonna be more try gift shops. <laughs> yeah, I mean a lot of the old stores are not there anymore. Real power here is held by the major business associations, or DONGs, like the Sung Sin Association and the An Long Association. And this is the third major DONG, the Hip Sing Association, where Benny Ong was leader. Police and residents refer to the DONGs as the Chinese Mafia. Now, they do often perform benevolent acts throughout the community, but every single DONG is affiliated with a gang, gang squad operating across the alley behind the city's oldest police precinct, the fifth. Maps and notebooks filled with mug shots help them to make sense of this seamy underworld. Chinese gang members are newer on the scene. They're from an urban province in southeast China. Unlike the older association members, some still first-generation Chinese American, police say the only tradition for the Fuchs is violence. Those cameras record everybody who comes up and down the stairs. On the outside, it looks like a beauty parlor, but on the inside, officers at the 5th Precinct say it's actually something very different. It's a front for a house of prostitution. When we arrived, the working women ran out. The cubicles, now empty, but for the clothes they left behind. So theoretically, the money that's made here goes where? Associations. Yeah. Well, well, associations, that's... and they'll use it for legal activities, open up other gambling parlors, other prostitution uh, locations, drugs. One flight up, a gambling hall nobody home. Not the case at 119 Hester Street, a gambling operation in full swing moments earlier. Now, we could hear a pin drop. It's just like Atlantic City. They use chips and the money that the chips are cashed in for. It's kept in a drawer under the table. Leaving the tables as they were, the 5th Precinct gang unit left. As soon as we were gone, life returned to this illegal gang-run gambling parlor. And like the other site, right next door, a prostitution ring. <laughs> the madam is warning the other girls there's a camera here. So she pays off the Fukunese gang members. She ain't telling us she did, but she probably is. She's too good, you know, I'm too scared. Saigon has to be up on Broadway for the past three years and uh, still propagate the uh, mainstream stereotyping of what Asian woman should be. For. Well, they're making money, so. Yeah, we know. <laughs> but the money doesn't trickle down to a uh, community as it should. But I the, the discrimination, you know, the, the years and years of history. You know, I mean that the, a lot of the seniors were talking about the struggles that they themselves went through, the discrimination that they faced. For us to sort of adapt or assume <laughs> to the sort of very crowded area is kind of difficult. Of the population gets, seems to get smaller somehow. I know. So I grew up live, sleeping on the couch. <laughs> oh yes. Yeah, or throw up bed or, or something. You know. yeah. So it's just, but the condition hasn't changed. I mean, now it's in some sense it's even worse. 
uh, people living in cubicles and yeah. yeah. But of course, I, uh, nobody has taken the. <laughs> That's illegal, and a lot of things seems to be illegal. And, and well, the problem it just it just it's got oversight. More and more. I mean, it becomes an oversight to a lot of people. I would say so. I would say. Well, no, I mean, a lot of it is it's just survival, and then people are not gonna you know complain about it or whatever, and that just create even you know worse conditions. But, you know, that the bottom line is that we also have to fight for what we think will make some of that change. I mean, in terms of the housing area, I mean, we know we need more affordable housing. And just, low you income. Know, low income or, and at the same time, some of it really needs to be like more like those, what they call SRO units. Because for a single person or someone who's starting out, they don't need a whole apartment. They just need a, a nice, clean, safe room to stay, and, but the government are not providing resources to build that kind of housing, because the whole, you know, problem with welfare hotels, you know, they close down a lot of SROs, but in our community, actually, there's a great need for those types of housing, and um, the funding sources are not there. Demonstrators were arrested for trespassing, but that's nothing new. 20 were picked up last Thursday and Friday, and the protesters don't show any signs of being discouraged. We need to that's fight for the district. The tactics. That's what happened to us. Like after we got after after we got the district, then they jumped in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Once we get the funding, because I, I felt that as an Asian woman, as an artist, developing a cultural a new type of Asian American culture was my, you know, mm -hmm. forte. I thought I had that <laughs> talent to do. I, I, you know, when we had the talent to get ascertain the uh, money uh, for a community arts group because that the timing was just right mm -hmm. at the time. But now because of government funding, not trusting the artists that were there's so many budget mm -hmm. cuts on that level. So I think in a way the community suffered for the past 10, 15 mm -hmm. years, 10 years, let's say. That Chinatown will always be the home for the senior citizens mm -hmm. uh, and also for new immigrants. That reminded me even when the first time that I ran for the city council, I had um, a fundraising dinner in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. And part of um, my speech, I was talking about the struggle of our ancestor, you know, discrimination and the, the struggle that they went through, and why is it important for us to really exercise our rights and in terms of, you know, getting involved in voting and, and fighting for representation. And within the audience, a lot of the older people, I mean, they were like, it was so quiet. Everybody was listening, and they were like, some of them even had tears in their eyes to, to realize that, Yes, you know, our time has come. Then. I mean, the way that the, the immigrant family are set up, that both parents are working. So the woman is not at home taking care of the kids, and she's going out there, she's making a living. And some, in some cases, she might be making even more money than the husband. So in, in a sense, she has an equal say in terms of how things are being done at home or how monies are being spent. So it's, it's a little bit more different that way. I think for us, you know, who are daughters, because my mother worked. She went out there and she worked, and I helped her or I take care. I actually took care of what's going on at home because she couldn't get home early enough to cook dinner. I, I had to do that. Um, so that growing up, I actually took care of a lot of stuff. I had to play a leadership role in terms of shopping and, and getting, you know, buying groceries or whatever. So that I found that a lot of um, girls growing up in, in that time, I think even for now, have to do a lot more. We make the demands. It doesn't always work. Police tell us this 14-year-old girl is a gang member. You just like to play with them? What kind of things do you do when you play with them? 
Huh? Hang around in the park. Hang around in the park? Uh -huh. Do you ever see guns? No. Do you ever see anybody get hurt? Yes. Have you seen anybody get killed? I wasn't there when they got killed. You weren't there when the guy got yeah. killed. But aren't you scared to be with people who kill other people? Yes. You are? Then why do you hang around them? You're 14 years old. Why do you do it? You can tell me. Tell me why. Because it makes you feel good to be with the group? Yeah. Can we give you some petitions to bring us Mr. Mattis? I think a demonstration helps in order to show the demands, the immediate demands that have to be rectified. And then you also see the, the discrimination, you know, the... and an end to racism in the construction industry and an end to all employment discrimination. Two, that the government, union, and contractors vigorously remedy the century-old pattern of exclusion of Asian Americans from construction industry and to establish specific employment goals. Three, that 25% of the construction workers at Confucius Plaza be Asian Americans, including all crafts and all levels. We mean trainees, apprentices, journeymen, and foremen. And that 40, 40 such workers be hired immediately. Four, that an Asian American investigator be hired to monitor the programs which will be hiring these minorities into the construction industry. Both at Confucius Plaza, and at other sites. This is only a beginning to reach out for the right to equal opportunity in employment in all areas for all Asian Americans, for all minorities. With our people's history firmly in mind, we want to ensure that our children are not going to the same discriminatory hiring practices which we, which our mothers, our fathers, our grandparents have been subject to, and which we today are still struggling to attain full. Chinese speak no English. City College, 
and she was from your year. No, no. Or she was a year of advance. Was uh, but I was, like she started doing some research about uh, the construction business and saw a lot of discrepancy and then began talking to Takashi Yanagita who recently became the director of our organization. And um, so they thought of targeting the um, um, Confucius Plaza construction business because since... All right, let's go. Leave my crew alone. Right now. Hey, yo, yo. living yeah, they have a old buildings. A couple of buildings. So that, but, I mean, the, the whole rallying point was that it was a community project, and it was really the first one in Chinatown, and they really should hire Chinese construction workers. Yeah. And the reason they were given, I mean, that we couldn't speak the language, or we're not in a union, or just not, you know, enough. I mean, that was a vicious cycle. Yeah. And, it's, it's, and we found out all the discrepancy of... Um, how the Italians were hired their sons to yeah. join in, and, and there's a whole tradition behind that. That wasn't even worth talking to about. And we were actually discussing what our strategy should be. And a group of policemen came down. And without giving adequate warning, adequate time, they just went down and made a very brief and quick announcement saying that if you don't leave right away, you'll be arrested. And without giving people a chance to decide, they just ran and grabbed anybody who was still around. Sequentially, it didn't really happen in that format or something, because I feel it started with like five of us demonstrating, and then from there, I would say in a month, you wind up getting about 10,000, 5,000 5, people coming in from all parts of life in the city, in Philadelphia, in Boston, in D.C., and, you know, this became almost big affair. Yeah, I, mean, I think it, it led to other, it, sh yeah. it led to other struggles across, you know, other communi it, Asian I think communities. It was There's the setback of, um, you know, that so groups are, would demonstrate made for one day and then go home and be happy. Whereas it takes a lot of effort, a lot of coordination. A lot of people who know what they're doing to pull it off. And one recruiting the uh, fight back, you know, people up in Harlem. Hey, it's one of the best 
times when, like, we, we got all the ethnics together and started talking. Who's the mayor at the time? Koch? No, no. Four Koch. Wagner? Four Koch. Lindsay, not Lindsay. No, no B. later it still hasn't changed. I, uh, when the federal right. building went up, they weren't hiring either. Yeah, the, the uh, hiring practices are still the same, aren't they? One and a half weeks of picketing and mobilization of more community support follow. It's a photo of mine, I'm sure. all the Asian women when <laughs> we try to get into the uh, gate. Yep. That was a terrible scene. Police expected some trouble. There have been almost 50 arrests in the last two weeks here, and today was no different. Protests are getting bigger, louder, and rougher. But the demonstrators call for jobs now has yet to be answered. They're hoping that the attention focused on these demonstrations will force that answer soon. to meet minority hiring quotas. And they claim the Mattis tries to fit the blacks and Puerto Ricans against the Chinese. There's no company reaction today, but the city housing and development administration contends the Mattis is better at meeting equal employment regulations than most other big contractors. When this site was checked last week, the city says minorities made up half of the workforce. It was far below that today. Consolidated Benevolent Association announced in the newspapers and radio their opposition to demonstrations and the participation of black and Latin workers. They met with government mediators to arrange a separate settlement. However, the community continued to organize its largest demonstration. You heard at that time this, the establishment, CCB, was telling people not to demonstrate. You know, they did not support the struggle, and they said it was wrong to demonstrate, and you can get in trouble for demonstrating. A lot of people didn't listen. You know, garment workers and seniors and, and students you know, all participated in, in the well, demonstration. Deep Confucius Plaza, where the first time in history that we have gotten involved with more 
organizations that we never gotten before. It's very important that we build a unity among all minority groups around the city. Because unless we're able to build that time an operation, then we all gonna lose this struggle. Confucius Plaza marked a reawakening of the fight against oppression for Chinatown and it pointed to the political changes that must be made for equality to be gained. When we were young, I was very idealistic and it's very idealistic, I think, that a lot of, I mean, as freshly graduated students with ideals and things were about to, on the verge of changing to be part of that participating part of the whole element was interesting and uh, but the, I mean the, the solution that 20 years now is like as you saw the credits went by that only guys only the guys did it and it's like why are we sitting here Margaret looking at this I, 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 know, I knew I participated in it. I took a lot of photos and did a lot of logistics and just... Well, it depends who was doing the documentary. Yeah, it was, right. one, it was one man who took the whole job, the whole responsibility on his own and hasn't been able to distribute this or find sponsors or whatever is necessary in the media business to... The way, the way he documented, though, was just what was in the media and the news and stuff. I mean, he didn't, I mean, he should have interviewed people and, and find out more about what were the strategies. But I, I called him up about that. I did. I really did. I mean, and there were strategies. <laughs> there were. There were a lot of coordination. Mm -hmm. It took a lot. And a lot of it, I think, a woman a lot of it was the woman's part of it too and for one for the organization I was involved with just <laughs> there was a lot of really a lot of projects that was going on you know there's what basement was the history or mm -hmm. history project or whatever like we're the women in this whole process of development and I was just overwhelmed that it it took me almost 20 years to get this tape, access of it for this tape. I did speak to the filmmaker like maybe five or 10 years ago when I saw the video. He had nothing much to say. I want the problem though is to try to, I think, to, ha to open up the, um, that struggle for themselves to realize that this is a positive, I think it's a positive, um, action that was taken 20 years ago. Oh yeah, I mean, if, I think people, a lot of us, you know, who participated made a difference. You know, if I didn't participate in a demonstration or in a picket, I might be doing something else now. But it took a lot to take that step to be involved. And once you get involved, um, I mean, I have a different perspective of how, you know, from an outside perspective of uh, of, uh, I think the community change in this direction and uh, why we're still stuck in this kind of rut. <laughs> As for me, I individually went out and had to fight my landlord or go out and observe other countries and their um, 
struggle for democratic rights, which is pretty, which is pretty amazing for me to see. Uh, uh, being in a microscopic community in Chinatown, New York City, and then going to the Philippines and seeing a whole country, a whole nation, do the same type of policies, and I was just overwhelmed with such uh, feelings. <laughs> That was kind of an exciting moment, I think, to see, to see a country change its policies and its struggle. And I think the rationale of the population to understand what oppression is all about and so on. today was like you know, the Chinatown History Project is going to give a walking tour of the invisible Chinese woman, <laughs> which makes us back to square one, I feel, in, in certain respect. And, you know... Uh, well, we should find out why they're doing such a tour. Well, I mean, we're not. Back to that documentary, I mean, a lot of the women who were around at that time or who played a leadership role, I mean, a lot of them are still around. Yeah. Faye is heading up the Chinese you know, History Project or History Museum. Yiling is, is um, lawyer. a lawyer in the community. Lydia is building housing. Um, and some of these women are still around. You know, they're, they're doing different things, and I think all of them are mothers you know, with children, like myself. Um, at that time, I was still a you know, college student, and as Confucius Plaza was actually my first demonstration of my first picket. Um, and growing up you know, in Chinatown, in a traditional family, and I mean, it was, it was a big step to get involved in a demonstration or even in a picket line. Because I remember that time, I already started doing some community work. I was doing a daycare. Um, that was part of um, a program at City College. I, 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 took, up, I took Asian study. Is this still around? Uh, yeah. Still with the China. Yeah. Children's Underground, right? Oh, um, yeah, it's called AC, yeah, Asian Children's Underground, um, at that time. Yeah. <laughs> the name is because it started out in a basement of a church. And it's Asian Children, that's why they call Asian Children Underground. Underground Railroad. <laughs> the, the video, it did bring back a lot of memory, I mean, but then when you look at it 20 years later, I mean, when they build the Federal Plaza building, it's the same situation. They don't want, you know, they didn't hire Asian workers. You still have to demonstrate. You still have to, you know, fight for those positions. But, but it comes down to that we still don't have political clout. I mean, when you come, when you talk about representative, we don't have any elected officials that can speak for us. That because even after Confucius Plaza, um, the police demonstration, the the, the anti-police brutality, mm -hmm. the people who were in leadership were women. Um, and when we had budget cut demonstration, I remember, you know, going there with parents. I mean, it was really, it's the mother who was always involved. It was the garment workers who were demonstrating. So it was like, in some sense, we always had models out there and examples out there in terms of women being the active one and taking the leadership role. I think in some sense, some of the, for Asian men, I think they don't have enough role model in that sense um, for them.
especially some of the elders in the family association that I had to reach out to. I mean, family association, most all the leadership are men. Mm -hmm. And all the meetings, you know, on them, you yeah, know, attending the meeting. Strange to see and, well, I but I was able to make the contact, go up to them. I think one of the, the things that I found was helpful was that I was able to speak the language. And also, um, being someone who grew up in the community, I was able to relate to them. And the language thing was very, very important. Um, I know that when I went up to my family association, the, the, the chins, um, the fact that I could speak Toysanese and the fact that I could um, tell them because my grandpa my grandfather was involved in the, in the past with the associations and had roots and they knew that I was a granddaughter, someone's granddaughter, um, that was helpful. Um, and the fact that at that point there was no other candidates and the, the reason that we had to um, work together, we had to fight for representation and also because I took the lead. Nobody else was out there talking about representation at that time. And this was in 1990 when we had the, we voted in a new charter and they were going to expand the city council. And at that point, um, we wanted a district that will give us an opportunity to vote and elect one of our own. We'll talk about an opportunity. And for them, they didn't even think, a lot of them didn't know that, that that was happening or didn't even think about it. So the fact that I was, out there first, I think that, and, and raise the issue, I think that made a, a big difference in terms of getting support. Yeah, and more visibility to the entire culture. Well, well it was later on, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, it was like, I mean, but if there was uh, a male candidate, let's say, in the beginning, they could well, very yeah, easily... Well, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, we don't, uh, we do, right? policy and its issue that he had to do to do it. Yeah, the president wasn't, he was standing on the sideline. Yeah. He wasn't yeah, taking well, a lead. I think that's he wasn't usual. taking a lead, but we, we took the lead to say right. we need to that's fight for the district. That's usually the tactics that could happen to us. Like after, we got, after we got the district, I mean, the women were not acknowledged. I'm saying that we always, in a sense, are the more active one and, and play a leadership role. A lot of time, it might not be recognized, in a sense. And the way that the community structures are set up, a lot of the more traditional organization is still male-dominated. And within Chinatown, you really have to know how to navigate. I mean, there are organizations that you do have to touch base with to get their support. And they're male-dominated, and you have to deal with it. Um, in some organizations, a woman will not ever be elected president of those organizations uh, because of the way it is set up. So do we spend time going in there and, and try to rock the boat? Or do we coexist? And I think in some sense, you have to coexist to bring them along. Like on issues when we were fighting for the district, we took the lead, they came along. Same thing with the parents' meeting. You know, the president of CCBA came to the meeting, spoke with people. But who was in, the, in charge? It was the women. It was the mothers and the woman who was running the show. I mean, who was really doing all the organizing and stuff. So in, in some sense that you, we still have to learn to work with them. And something you know, pay respect to your elders and, and bring them along. And they are, you know, and, and they are supportive. When, when they see the issue. I mean, when I was running, when they came, they came to my dinner and then g they gave me support. Um, and it was really unconditional support because there were other people with like, for example, like the business interests. Uh, the first time around in 1991, they supported the Republican who was Chinese, who was male. Um, he raised a lot of money and he was able to get those people support. Um, but I still had a solid base of people in the community, and a lot of them were, you know, male-dominated organization, the family association. They believed in me, and they supported me. They would try to tell the Republican, "You guys should drop out and just support her." Um, so, in some sense, that for us who are, you know, 
playing a leadership role in a sense, trying to work with everyone. You have to know those dynamics. We don't have to tell them in a sense that we're taking the lead. Uh, but we are. That's objective reality. And there are times that we may not get recognized. But when you really look out there and when people do know who is really doing the work and who is really because you do hear from people and they do have respect for the kind of work that some of the women who are doing. They might not get publicized all over the place, but when they come down to it for people who are really committed and who really know what's going on, they know who the active people are. And, and in some sense, that might be enough for a while. Um, I think also talking to the... So-called godfather of Chinatown was laid to rest today in what was that neighborhood's biggest funeral procession in history. And now the people closest to him are vying for power, wondering who will be the next Chinatown mob boss. Pauline Liu is born. The reputed godfather of Chinatown was finally laid to rest today. The community he loved paid tribute with a 150 limo funeral procession, its largest ever. 87-year-old Benny Ong, who is known as Uncle Benny, died of prostate cancer nearly two weeks ago. But his funeral was put off until now so that friends and associates from around the world could attend. of rival gangsters, Asian crime experts called it a show of face. That had police and FBI in attendance too, secretly capturing pictures and documenting a who's who list of suspected Asian gangsters. I hate to say, but it's still the young woman who is the one who's actually speaking up and, and really taking charge. Because we also have, uh, we have a group of high school students. They all came from the same high school and they all joined. But it's the, the young woman who's actually taking the lead. And when we had the forum, she spoke up, raised the question and, and voiced her opinion. But the, the young men didn't say anything. Okay, dog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I have no idea whether to tell this here. Come, dog. Bye. Dog. Hello. Good to talk. It is the year of the dog. Okay. Well, well, symbolism of this dog. Yes. Very <laughs> dog. Oh gosh, licked on my chair. Oh well, no, new chair. <laughs> oh, that was very good. You like that? Oh, oh, are we off or should we continue? Well, let's say something. Like, I think we grew up in Chinatown. Um, uh, almost, you know. Yeah, I, uh, at the same era, <laughs> in the same era.